Come on in, have a seat, laugh at me, laugh with me. What do I care? I'm 69 years, I don't care. <laughs> Just laugh, we need to laugh, it's essential. Okay, no matter what you hear, comedy is too essential. Comic Spot was created so that this army veteran right here, me, can vet out veterans of comedy. So every day we have a few veteran comics for comedians, funny people, who are gonna share their life, their passion, their legacy, their trajectory of their career, everything. They're gonna open up their lives for you and make you laugh while you're listening. This is the funnest thing I've ever done in my life, including giving birth. Of course, no one thinks that's fun. So that was easy to beat, but I'm gonna read you. The man in the box over here, see this is the woman over here and that's the man. And Gary Held is over there, Gary R. Held. He's here today to talk about everything he's accomplished and something amazing he's working on he wants you to know about. Let me read you the words he sent me. I love reading people's intros. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. Yes, I have, pre oh, no, that's not really part of your intro. Never mind. Gary Held is an eight-year veteran of the Air Force. He is a military veteran and a veteran of comedy. Woo! Double time. We're winning all over the place. He's an eight-year veteran of the Air Force. Did you hear that? I didn't even make it three years in the Army. <laughs> Almost, but not quite. He's been living with MS, and I don't think that means his wife. He's been living with MS, multiple sclerosis, for over 40 years. He's a sit down comic who entered comedy on a dare in 2016. So let's get to know him. This man here came to talk. Let's get to it. Welcome, V. Gary R. Held. Hi, Gary. Hey, Woo! Linda. Yay. We Yay. are going to do some laughing together today. Yes, let's do this. Two old timer veterans sharing the screen together i'm so excited isn't this great and you're so eight exciting. years in the air force oh my I gosh did. i did linda and it's funny because i went in and mm -hmm. i joined the air force at 17 years old to be a police officer a security policeman yes and i became a medic and it was that <laughs> that was that first education that they don't always give you what they tell you they're going to give you yes so i spent four years as a medic mm -hmm. and i said now the truth comes out I spent my next four years as a recruiter. And when someone said they wanted to be a pilot or they wanted to be a mechanic or they wanted to be a medic, that's what they went in the Air Force as. Good for you. So you yep. made sure you weren't lying to people. I am proud to say that I still hold some Air Force records today. I was discharged in 1980 and I'm still in the record books today with some very honorable uh, awards. Wonderful. Do you wanna tell us what awards you have? So my biggest award was in mm -hmm. December of 1976, I am in the record books for enlisting the most recruits ever in the history of the Air Force. What? I put 22 guys in in the month of December, 1976. Wow. My quota was four. Wow. I know, just now think that... if I'd have got paid for that, Linda, I'd have been rich. Totally, oh my I gosh. Know. <laughs> they think that recruiters are on commission. My ex-husband was a recruiter. It was a great job because you're a civilian, you're a military guy in a civilian community. So it was pretty cool. Yeah, it is cool that way. What city were you a recruiter in? Rochester, Minnesota. Whoa. Yeah. Wow. So my ex came from Jackson, Minnesota in 1972. Okay. Yeah. So I was getting it kind of close to you, but not no cigars. Close. Yep, that's the year I went in, 1972. I'll be darned. Yep. Okay. So what are some things that you learned in the military that have helped you hang in there through comedy and help you hang in there through a pandemic? We've learned so much in the military. You do. I think the main thing is that you respect, discipline, um, behaviors, 
those things have carried with me. I've been out of the Air Force since 1980. And a lot of those tendencies, especially some of the OCD military tendencies, still stay with me today. Yes. In fact, me I too. use it in one of my bits. Do you? I do. The OCD? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have PTSD and I, I love doing my PTSD bit. You know, it's a fun bit to do. Unless you have people that are really new with PTSD, like if returning combat veterans, maybe not a good idea. But right, but you know what? It's a good idea to be able to laugh at yourself. And I do, I love yeah. laughing at me. Yeah. Yes. So talk to me about your early childhood that made you go after this comedy jungle. So I really didn't have any anticipation of going after this comedy jungle when I was young, although okay. I was kind of the clever class clown kind of guy always. Yes. But believe it, much like you, I entered comedy at 62 years old. And I'll never forget Rick Bronson from the House of Comedy in Phoenix, who has four different comedy clubs around the country. He said to me, he put his arm around me and he says, Gary, you got big balls going into stand-up comedy at 62 years old. Oh. And that, you know, to me, that was a great compliment. That's and it kind of gave me the encouragement I needed. Yes. I so, did it on the dare, Linda. Talk to me about the dare, Gary. Sitting at a cigar bar on a Sunday night with my two friends, John and Gemma, just being funny and telling jokes. And they said, you ought to be a stand-up comic. And I said, that's ridiculous. So I started going to some open mic nights and not to disparage anybody else, but I said, I can be funnier than them. You know how you see other people and you say, I got that inside of me. Yes. So great story of my first opening night, April of 2016 at the House of Comedy, Tuesday night, normal crowd for open mic night is 35, 40 people with 15, 16 comics. There was 116 people there and 89 of them were my cigar friends. I had fantastic support for my very first night on stage. Wow. I was supposed to get four minutes. I got nine minutes. Standing oh. ovation going up, standing ovation going down. I was hooked. Wow. It was fun. And so how has your comedy career been since then? Was, was that a freak thing because all your friends were there or did that continue? Those no, kind it of wasn't results? a freak thing at all. And I, you know, one of the things that I learned early on was my style is a storyteller, not a joke teller. So I'd I did things that were real in my life and I had great success that way. And I have to say that in my first year of comedy doing the improv and the comedy spot in the House of Comedy, I never had a heckler because I kind of commanded the audience, yes. which is a skill. Yes. And I never, uh, I never had a set where I bombed. So knock wood, I was very fortunate. Uh, I, because of that, I kept re-energizing and recharging and it yes. was just awesome. That's amazing. Congratulations. What a great, great feat to have. Here's, here's the one suggestion I give, cause I do a lot of these open mics. Mm -hmm. There, you can't, I can't emphasize enough, rehearse, 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 know your material, know it as if you're performing for a million dollars on the stage that night and be prepared to go out there. And I don't care if I'm doing a five minute open mic or if I'm doing a 10 minute feature, I rehearse equally as much for every set that I do. Wonderful. So you mentioned that you've been struggling or that you've been overcoming, dealing with, living with, MS. Can we take a minute to talk about that? 40 years I've been living with a unpredictable, mm -hmm. incurable, lifelong disease. I now walk with two sticks for balance. That made it difficult doing the clubs, Linda, and I'll talk about why I went to a different direction. Okay. Most of the clubs are older clubs, and yes. very few of them have handicap access to the stage. And it was very difficult for me to get up these wobbly steps and onto the stage and then have to sit on a stool. So I kind of, after about a year and a half or so into the club scene, I kind of shifted to private parties and corporate comedy because right. it had a, it was an easier feel for me with my my uh, challenges for walking. Great. And, those and that's why I became, the sit down, I became the sit down comic because now I sit down to do my sets instead of standing up. And how has corporate comedy treated you? You know, cr private parties and corporate comedy is awesome because number one, you'll appreciate this, it pays well. Yes. I do longer sets. It 
it forced me from going to a 15 minute feature to a, a 60 minute set or a 90 minute set, which means you have to get back to the table and start creating and preparing. So I've, I've done several 60 and 90 minute sets, which is a long time as a solo comic. Yes, it's a long time. And I love it. That's great. And I love it. Every I love every bit of it. So how many 60 and 90 minute sets do you have? So obviously I do, I've been able to do some carryover because I'm not performing to the same audience every night. That was the one thing I found with the clubs mm -hmm. because the clubs here in Arizona, they don't book you unless you bring your friends. So I had to, I was forced to make new material because my friends were following me once or twice a week. I didn't want them to have to hear the same jokes. So I have, I have a journal, every joke I've ever written. I have a journal that tells me what the joke is, the name of the, the name of the bit and how long it goes. So depending on what I'm going to be doing on stage, I can fill, figure out, is it five minute? Is it seven? Is it 15? And I can pick out from the journal based on my crowd and how many minutes I have. That's what I do too. I have every joke timed. Yeah. See where that's OCD. That's, that's a little okay. bit of OCD. I got it. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. You know, it's easy to get OCD when it's something you love. I never had OCD in math class. Yeah, exactly, huh? I never had OCD in cooking class. <laughs> no. I hated boy. putting the flour in the pan the right way. I've never had OCD with anything, but once I learned how to write jokes, it's like some days I've written a hundred jokes if I'm sad. You yeah. Know? Or, you know, told, made a hundred, gone out and made a hundred people laugh at the grocery store. You know, like, that's just like, I like finding sad people and making people laugh. Yeah, it, that's what it's all about. Yeah. It used to be hard to find sad people or depressed people. And it's gotten really easy lately. I don't know if you noticed. It's uh, a lot easier now. And it's, it's, it's too bad because the one thing that we get to control in our life is our happiness. And people yeah. forget that we get to control our happiness. Yeah. And right when everybody is so sad and depressed, they're saying that it isn't essential to have comedy. So I hope this pandemic gets over safely very soon so that essentialness of making people laugh can go back to getting fulfilled. I, I agree. The one thing the pandemic has done for us comics, mm -hmm. it sure has introduced us to lots and lots of other great comics from all over the world through these online open mics. It's been awesome. Hasn't it been great? Been where, so all much have your, where all has your open mics on Zoom or shows taken you around the world? So I did, I do Rachel's from Salt Lake City a lot. Yes. I started Rachel doing um, Brooks. Uh, and Erica's from Hawaii, and uh, I've and then I've done a few other little ones, but it's just we meet such great people, yes. and, and we do. And here's the challenge: you're looking into that little camera on your laptop, doing comedy to the greatest critics ever, other comics. Yes. Other comics don't want us to be funny, Linda. They want to be the funniest. Exactly. So it makes us better, and it's been wonderful. So what's it like living with MS? I know I'm getting serious. I'm going right for the jugular here. You, you are a positive guy, but you have a negative thing hanging around and you're long suffering with it. I just had a drunk driver hit me and I had a brain injury in 96 and it took forever to get as good as I am right now. You know, and I know that when you have, if you stub your toe and it doesn't heal in six months, people shy away from you. You've been suffering 40 years, what, how has that impacted your life and relationships? It doesn't. And here's the reason why. Okay. MS to me is called my shit. <laughs> it's nothing more than an inconvenience to me. I get up in the morning. I deal with what God gives me every day. Um, I've been very active in the MS world. I was the chairman of the board of the MS Society in Arizona for four and a half years. I was involved in the national board uh, out of New York with the MS Society. And the thing I try to impress upon people that have MS, men or women, mm -hmm. deal with it every day because you're not going to change it. You're, you're, you might band-aid it once in a while. It's not going away. So you make the decision on how you're going to deal with it. First, so for me, it's just an inconvenience. Wow. You're a motivational speaker too. I did that when I first retired from the bingo business. I was a motivational speaker. You retired from the bingo business? I myself and two partners had the largest electronic bingo company in the world. No way. Where you play bingo on a computer instead of with the ink marker. Yes. Yeah, had the largest in the world. Started in 94, took um, it public in 97, and we all retired seven years later. 
It was yes. the American dream come true. Yeah. It was awesome. I'm that's super dope. Oh my gosh. So, you know, we don't have a lot of time just because of my finances on this T-Mobile hotspot. I want to give you ample time to talk about the cigar that you taught. You said you would mention earlier, you're going to something about the cigar and you got to tell me about the new show you're doing and how we can support it and follow okay. it. Okay. Thank you. The new show is called Cigars and Comedy. If you know, through history, there's a lot of very famous comedians that smoke cigars. George Burns, Groucho Marx, uh, Milton Burrow, lots of... But nobody's ever taken the two topics of cigars and comedy and kind of in intermingled them. So I did. A friend of mine said, Gary, you know what? You love cigars. You love comedy. Why don't you start a YouTube channel and do a program? So every Wednesday at noon, um, I do a Zoom conference with a cigar shop owner, a cigar vendor, a private club owner, a cigar smoker. These are all the people that I'm gonna to talk to and why we do our 15 minutes. We're gonna be talking about cigars and we're gonna be telling jokes and we're gonna be talking about the history of comics that smoke cigars. So Cigars and Comedy, my YouTube channel, Cigars and Comedy. Um, I will be doing my Zoom conferences at noon Arizona time, Mountain Standard, every Wednesday at noon for 15 minutes. Wonderful. That is amazing. So on your YouTube, how long ago did you start it? How many followers do you have so far? I'm glad you didn't ask that because I started last week and I've got 12 followers so far because well, we I'm can... brand new. Haven't even posted my first uh, video from the Zoom because I couldn't figure out how to edit it. So I'm learning just like you've been learning. Totally. So next week I'll have my first interview posted with all my editing, my music, my intro and all that stuff. So brand new. Wonderful. So we'll get people over to your YouTube channel to subscribe, Please knowing do. Full, well, full well that you're committed every week, putting out new content that's very relatable and it's, it'll grow. It'll grow. It'll grow. Like, it'll grow. You have to start someplace. Yes. Yes. So what made you want to do a YouTube video show every week to be that committed for this? What was... Why is that that you're passionate because about? Because I am retired and have nothing to do but what I want to do that makes me happy, just like you. Yep. Making people laugh makes me happy. And if I can do that and combine it with my passion for smoking cigars, I think I have a winner. Totally, totally. You're just like me. We're out of the same mold. Exactly. That's going to work then because that's who you are. You know, that's you're not going to have to try. That's who I am. This is going to be awesome. What else would you like to cover? We bounced around a little bit on your growing up, a little bit about your comedy. Have we forgotten anything that you're going to regret not getting to say? No, you know what? Uh, being a storyteller, like the comic that I just watched in a previous interview, mm -hmm. um, uh, Joey Viagra, whatever his name was, that was a great name, by the way, and his costume. <laughs> my, my stories are built on... Uh, my divorce from my wife. I was married 34 years and now I've been divorced eight. Online dating, which is an ever it, material every day comes from my online dating experiences. And I drove Uber and Lyft when it first came to Arizona about seven years ago. Just those three topics alone, let alone everything else that happens in my life every day, gives me material to put in my journal every single day. Wow. That's great. I am speechless. You're such a positive guy. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. So the online dating, tell me something funny that I would not know about online dating. So everybody wants to have the perfect profile. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to have the perfect profile, whether it's true or not. So my <laughs> profile, my profile, I, I spent a lot of time preparing it. And it said something like this. I ride Harley Davidson. I hang out at a cigar shop. The only baggage I have will be you on the back of my Harley. <laughs> I love sex and trust that you do too and hope that you're willing to give it up on demand. <laughs> My favorite thing is to see a woman's cleavage and I hope you're willing to show yours whether your tits are real or fake. <laughs> I don't, I'm not looking for some Scottsdale divorcee seeking her next spousal maintenance check. <laughs> if this profile fits you, please send naked pictures for my viewing pleasure. <laughs> That's hilarious. How's Everybody that wants the perfect profile. How's it been working for you? <laughs> yeah, you know what? I've got lots of experience. I will tell you that. 
<laughs> I'm not going to go beyond. I won't go beyond that. I'll just, I will tell you this. My dating journal is starting to look like the white pages. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. So what's the legacy you're trying to leave? Because there's so many different facets to legacies I'm hearing. I'm hearing overcoming MS, overcoming a divorce. You know, like there's so many things that could be your, what's the main, if you had to pick one thing in your life that you want to be remembered for, what is that or has it happened yet? So the legacy is for my grandchildren. I have a six and 10 year old, two son, two grandsons, six and 10. Okay. And my legacy for them is a book that I'm writing called From Spam to Ham and Back Again. And it's a story about their papa's life. So when they get older, they can go back. I don't care if it's a million seller. I'm going to publish the book. I want my grandchildren and my son to be able to go back to that book and say, this is what Papa did in his lifetime. Oh, that's awesome. That's I've had so a wonderful special. life. It sounds like you have. I'm so glad I got to know you. Likewise. I thank you. I'm thank you. I'm so glad you came on here so other people will get to know you. And your show, which airs on Wednesdays at 12 noon Arizona time, Mountain Standard will be on YouTube and your YouTube channel is called Don't Tell Me Cigars and Comedy. And it's Correct. new, it's new, but don't let that stop you from liking, subscribing and commenting and watching whatever pops up and help him grow his YouTube. He's passionate about cigars and comedy. So let's Linda, help It's been him. wonderful being on your show. Thank you so much Thank for having me. Thank you so much, Gary R. Held. You're a veteran and I love you a lot. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Back Bye. at you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Everybody's talking.